Now, can you hear me better? Good. Well, it's good to see all of you here today, bright and shining, and uh, uh, some of you little, look a little exhausted and tried. Uh, just a little sampling that I take sometimes. Uh, how, how many of you find that Christmas is sometimes, like we do it in America, is sometimes stressful? How many of you really don't like shopping for presents? Amen. <laughs> How many of you will be glad when it's about over? Wow. Well, there's a bunch of Scrooges here this morning. <laughs> Dickens' Christmas Carol is about true, isn't it, Daryl? Anyway, uh, I'm glad you're here, and I'm glad we're here on the eve when internationally we celebrate uh, the birth of Jesus. At least that's what it is purported to be. And I'm afraid that in many places, many times, it's something utterly different than that. It's not about Jesus. It's about things otherwise. Uh, so we'll, uh, we'll leave that as it is and go on from there. If you have your Bibles, will you turn with me, please, to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 3, the the third chapter of Matthew. For those of you who are in the Sunday school hour, you heard some brief commentary on the passages that I'm going to be dealing with this morning from Brother Dempsey, but we'll go back to that in a moment. In chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, you recognize that this is Jesus' arrival at the, the Jordan. He speaks to John the Baptist and uh, it's the time for Jesus to be identified with his people and to, to present himself the way John presented him as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. In verses 16, uh, verse 16 and 17 of the third chapter of Matthew. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Now you're in Matthew. Turn over to chapter 17, please. Matthew chapter 17. This is well into the ministry of Jesus in the record and at chapter 17, he takes uh, Peter and James and John uh, up into a mountain apart from the rest of the disciples. And while he was there, the Lord Jesus was transfigured before them. And notice in verse 2 of chapter 17, uh, as he was transfigured before them, his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. And then there appears Moses and Elijah. They talk with him, and Peter wants to build them a little tabernacle type thing. And while uh, he yet spake, this is Peter talking, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. Verse 5 of the 17th of Matthew. A bright cloud overshadowed them. And behold, a voice out of the cloud which said, this is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. And now, if you will, go with me to the Gospel of John, chapter 12. John, chapter 12. <clears throat> and in the twelfth of John, just a verse. Verse 28 of the 12th chapter of the Gospel of John. Well, we'll go to verse 27 first. Jesus is speaking. Now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this hour came I unto this hour. Verse 28. Father, glorify thy name. Then came there a voice from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. 
And the people, therefore, that stood by and heard it said that it thundered. Others said an angel spake unto him. Jesus answered and said, This voice came not because of me, but for your sakes. Uh, with that read, would you join me as we pray? And as we bow to pray, uh, pray for our Father to speak to our hearts today. And uh, I think it's always right and profitable for each one of us personally and private to say to him, Lord, speak to my heart, minister to me today, and give me ears to hear and eyes to see and understanding that is quickened by your presence to know and to learn your truth. And we pray for ourselves as well. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we're grateful to you for the privilege and the joy of an open Bible. And we come once again into your presence to seek the anointing and blessing that only you can give as we come to understand your truth. We know that this book is spirit written and we know that it can only be taught as it's spirit led and taught. And so we pray that you will in these moments bless and speak to our hearts and minister to us, Father, as only you can in ways that you know we stand in need. And in all of that, we pray that our Savior, the Lord Jesus, will be exalted and uplifted and that we'll all be strangely and wonderfully drawn to him. Magnify your Son today. Glorify him in our presence. For we pray in his dear and precious name. Amen. 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 Over the last few Sundays, we've been talking about angelic declarations that have been recorded in the scriptures for us. We talked about how the angels came to Mary and spoke to her about the fact that she was going to uh, bear a son that's miraculously conceived. And the word came to Joseph by way of an angel. And uh, Joseph was told that Mary was going to have this baby and that he was to... Uh, be named Jesus. And uh, if that were not enough, we also reminded ourselves about the angelic presentation and declaration to the shepherds that were out in the fields uh, watching over their flocks by night. That was all very interesting to us, and it's also very familiar to us. It's all part of this traditional story that's biblically recorded. Uh, that we've all gone over so many times. We also were reminded about Zacharias, that elderly man who was a priest in the temple. And while he was working at the altar of incense, an angel stood by the altar and told uh, old brother Zacharias that his wife Elizabeth, who was now well uh, along in her years, was going to have a baby and he was going to call his name John. And he was going to be the forerunner of the Lord Jesus. In all of these experiences, uh, we heard about uh, the truth that Jesus is coming. But in every one of these cases, it was an angelic messenger sent from God who came to these different people to give the message of the coming of the Son of God and of Jesus himself. And so these came directly from heaven. Uh, it was the voice of God. Uh, that we heard not only from the angels, but in the passages I read to you just a moment or two ago in the third of Matthew and the 17th of Matthew and then in John 12, all three of those passages record for us that while normal people were about their normal affairs, uh, there suddenly came a, an unusual, miraculous kind of spoke or spoken words from the heavenlies. Uh, they, they were declarations that came directly from heaven. And the Bible records that this was nothing less than the voice of God. That God who inhabits eternity, the God who is the creator of everything that exists, somehow speaks in an audible voice. And in every case that I read to you today, it's in reference to the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so because that's true, uh, and because we're here today uh, with this thing in our calendar, I, I'm not an occasional preacher. I, use, I don't usually preach much to whatever's going on in the calendar. But uh, that's where we are. But we notice that the word here that's being spoken is a word from God, and it's a word to His Son. So let's think for a moment or two about that, about what does it mean to us? How does it impact us that God does, in fact, speak to us? Now, if somebody comes in the church and tells me that uh, I was just coming over here this morning to go to church, and while I was riding along in my car, 
I, I heard this voice that came out of heaven and it told me not to worry about the speed limit. I could just go ahead because I was running late. I could go ahead and run 20 miles an hour over the speed limit. You know what I'm going to think? I'm going to think we need to call the people from the funny farm and pick this fella up. You know, I mean, when people start hearing voices from the heavens, I get a little concerned. Don't you? Now, why are we that way? Well, I think it's because this sort of thing has not ever happened in my lifetime or in yours. And I said, you, you may hear strange noises. And, and, and there are reasons for that. Uh, you may get strange impressions. <laughs> there are also sometimes reasons for that. It can be as simple as what you ate for supper last night that's giving you problems. There are all kinds of ways of getting messages, but listen. When God from heaven speaks a word, and he speaks an audible voice, uh, isn't it amazing? Think about this, that, that not only does God throughout the Old Testament tell us that we could not even begin to look upon his real presence, but what we would die. And even though Moses wanted to see the God that was dealing with him, God had to hide him in a cleft of a rock, and he said, when I go by, you'll see my glory. It'll blind you. You won't be able to see. And I'll go all the way past you. And you can just see behind me, but you cannot look on my face. Because if you do, you'll be dead. And now you're hearing these records in the scriptures about the one who speaks. The God who speaks out loud. And so in this third Chapter, verses 16 and 17 of Matthew, if you're there, let's see that situation for a moment. Jesus and, uh, has arrived at the Jordan River. He's talking to John the Baptist. Uh, John is a little bit concerned about the fact that Jesus wants to be baptized by John. And John says, no, you've got it in reverse. Uh, you should baptize me. I should not be baptizing you. And Jesus says, well, we're going to do the thing that's right. We're going to do the thing that's right. And we know that his baptism was not a baptism unto repentance, which was John's normal baptism. But rather, it was Jesus identifying himself with his people who would follow him. And later he'll say in the scriptures, he that believes and is baptized in that public declaration of allegiance to Christ and identify with Christ, he joins to this business of our, our personal profession of faith and experience of God's so great salvation. And so Jesus comes to John to be baptized. And as he's coming up out of the water, this voice speaks from heaven out loud. And God speaks and says, as he declares it out loud, Jesus is his son. At the same time, this Holy Spirit, uh, the, the, a dove comes down and lights on Jesus. And this is symbolic of the presence of the Holy Spirit of God. And so in a moment of time, recorded in Scripture, the Father the Son, and the Holy Spirit in triune personhood in the one essence of the God who is one are seen to be in appearance at the baptism of the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, so the Father speaks out loud. And this is what he says. He said, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. Now think about this. At this point in his life, the man, Jesus of Nazareth, 30 years have gone by since he was born. He's 30 years old. And he appears to John to be baptized. And then this voice from heaven speaks. Now, the father who has superintended and supervised his conception and his birth and everything that's occurred in his life from his birth until this moment in time, looks down upon him, this, this father who has overviewed his entire human experience and his entire human behavior, uh, every action, every attitude, every response, now declares, this is my beloved son, I'm completely well pleased at his private personal life in its entirety. So what's he saying? 
He's saying that from the moment of his conception till this moment of his baptism, I as the eternal father by the Holy Spirit have brought into existence the human Jesus who is the God-man, who is God in human flesh. And, and, and this dual nature of Christ is a mystery that we preachers talk about and that we all meditate and try to understand. And yet it goes beyond our comprehension. But here's God. And uh, he's saying about his son in terms of his private personal life throughout, from beginning to this moment in time, I am well pleased. And uh, it indicates and underlines for us the sinlessness and the sinless perfection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and that, that one passage alone then focuses for us uh, our attention on some things about the Lord Jesus that are, that are in view. And I want to mention them to you and have you think with me about them. First of all, he's talking to us about the person of his Son. And when we start talking about the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, we go back to what we celebrate now, that his uh, conception uh, by the word of the Spirit of God, the maintenance of this sinless perfection by the selfsame Holy Spirit, who created the humanity of Jesus and conceived that humanity in the virgin womb of Mary and had brought forth from that a birth of a sinless and perfect human being, uh, a replica of the first Adam that God made who was made in sinlessness and in moral perfection and lived in a perfect environment. And here he is now the second Adam and he's born and he's grown up now 30 years of age to be a man without sin. Now when we say that, we as Christians say ho-hum, I've heard this a thousand times, but I wonder if you've done more than hear it. Have you thought about it? Has it even considered at, at all what is imp implicated with the fact that Jesus himself as a man living on this planet walking the dusty trails of Galilee and and uh, Judea and uh, dealing with folks like you and me all the time never sinned never ever ever transgressed or violated in any degree the absolute perfect will of his father for him. No one else ever was like that on earth except Adam briefly until he sinned. And from Adam's sin and Eve's sin till now, there's never been another creature on planet earth like this one we talk about right here about Jesus. His absolute utter sinlessness in his person. So when we talk about the person of Jesus, uh, let me just revisit something we talked about in Sunday school briefly, and that is that Jesus is a unique character in all of history. There never was anybody like Jesus before Jesus, and not been anybody like Jesus since Jesus. He's the unique, singular one who appeared among us to bring us life and to bring us forgiveness. What can we say about him? Well, first of all, he was fully man. He was every bit as human as you are, but he did not inherit what you got when you were born. He did not inherit a human nature. He did not inherit a fallen nature. You're born a sinner. He was not. You were born with a sin nature that you inherited from your parents, and Jesus did not have an earthly parent as Dempsey pointed out this morning, Mary was simply the carrier and she was the vessel through which the perfect Jesus was born. And so he didn't inherit the, the nature of his mother. He didn't inherit the nature of his father. He didn't inherit the nature of his heavenly father. And that nature is one of perfect holiness. And so he didn't have a corrupted nature as all of Adam's sinful children do have. And, and then... <clears throat> Through the centuries, I want you to think about this, through the centuries, through all the years from Jesus' birth till now, saved people have tried to express the wonder and the majesty and the mystery and the reality of what it means to be God's beloved son. What does that mean when he says, this is my beloved son? We, we in our hymns, sing about his glory and his perfection 
the poets have written about it. If you've never read Milton, you need to read Milton as he talks about the Christ. And he talks about paradise lost and paradise regained. And maybe even in prophetic kinds of ways, uh, his great work on Samson Agonistes. Uh, and then maybe listen to Bunyan as he talks about the pilgrim's progress. And he gives you that picture of what it is to know the King of kings and Lord of lords. And live your life down here in the struggle from salvation to heaven at last. And these great poets and these great historians, uh, the theologians and the commentators all confess that Jesus has a name that's above every name. And he has that name because he has a nature that's above every name. He is, in fact, the son of the living God. And he is God with us, eternal and everlasting. And he's God with us walking about on planet Earth at that time in perfect human expression. And, and when you try to put that in your, together in your brain, uh, if you're like me, you'll get a little bit of a headache uh, because my brain can't, can't quite grasp all of that. Divinity and humanity in perfect union with one another. The one never being the other. Real humanity that can die, real divinity that can never die. Real humanity that can bleed and suffer. Real divinity that can oversee that and control and manage it. But never the two are the same and yet both are perfectly expressed in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. But not only the person of the Son that the Father acclaims as his own, but also the work of the Son. You know, when you think about who Jesus is, when the Father says, This is my beloved Son you can be brought very quickly in your thinking to think about the work of that son. Why did he come down? Well, he tells us he has come down to us to seek and to save that which was lost. And he comes down to us to bring glory to his Father in the saving of those who are lost. He magnifies the mercy of God. He magnifies the grace of God. He magnifies the love of God for sinners fallen down in sin. I love the phrase, he came down, because that's certainly what he did. He came down to accomplish all that the Father assigned him to do. Give this some thought sometime. Uh, in the counsel of a, of a triune God, when the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit developed and uh, conceived, and these are all human terms, and we, we get in trouble if we push them too far but the eternal covenant was made between the spirit and in that covenant the father was going to elect the people give them to the son they would eventually be on planet earth they would fall into sin the son would come to be the savior and the holy spirit would take all the work that the son did to save them and he would apply it to them and draw them savingly to the father and he would eventually and finally bring them safe home at last to be his eternal everlasting people now that's all uh, an overview kind of of this eternal what's called the the everlasting covenant but while he's here on planet earth the son has something to do and the father has assigned him a job. He's given him words that he is to speak. He's given him deeds that he should do. He's given him places that he should go. And he's got all of that to do. And so he came down to accomplish all that the Father had assigned him to do and to be. He was assigned to speak God's word. He said, the words that I speak unto you, they're not my words, but they're the words of him that sent me. So he was assigned to speak the words of God. He was also assigned this task of demonstrating God's love and compassion to a, a lost world. Do you, do you ever ask yourself the question, why in Jesus' ministry while he's on earth, public ministry, why does Mark list miracle after miracle after miracle? Why does Matthew bring up miracle after miracle after miracle? And when he does, Matthew says, this was done that it might be fulfilled and it'll take you back to the Old Testament. And he'll cite an Old Testament passage that predicted that the very thing that Jesus is doing and that Matthew is reporting was all a part of the plan mentioned many, many times, hundreds and hundreds of years before Jesus was ever born. And so he's come 
to demonstrate God's love and compassion through the, the miracles of healing and even the resurrection of the dead. Has it ever occurred to you that when Jesus was at the, the, the gate of the little village of Nain and the funeral procession was coming out the gate going to the burial hill and uh, Jesus stops a procession and there's a young man on the funeral bier that's he's dead and uh, the Jewish folks had ways of discerning that somebody was really dead and he's been dead now for a day or two and he's on the way to being buried and he stops it and there's a widow woman walking behind and her son was her hope of her life because the father is dead the son now must take responsibility for his mother and he must see to his mother's welfare until she, her life is finished but now the son is dead and to be a widow in Israel with no heirs and with no children to help sustain you was a terrible tragedy in those days when poverty was so rampant. And so she's weeping because she's lost her son. She's weeping because she's lost her inheritance. She's weeping because she's lost all that had belonged to her, to her husband. There are many reasons why she's weeping. And Jesus stops the funeral. And he lays his hand on that funeral procession and he tells the boy to get up and go home and take care of your mother and the wonder is that he got up he did exactly what he was told and, and th there's, there's all kind of lessons there uh, I never read that, but what my mind just, it just, that's just Kermit's mind. I, I just go back to the day when they were walking into town at another place. And there was a fig tree there that should have had figs on it, but it always got green leaves. And the kind of fig trees I grow, Tommy, they don't do anything but just grow leaves. But uh, anyway, uh, Jesus goes to the fig tree and he finds no figs on it. And you know what he does? He speaks to the tree. Now, if you make trees, if you create a tree out of nothing, you have a perfect right to talk to a tree. <laughs> but if you don't make them, please don't have any of us find you talking to them, okay? Scotty, I don't think that'll work. But Jesus speaks to the tree. And uh, they go on into town and do what they're going to do, spend the night. The next morning, they're leaving town. And the disciples stop and wonder at what has occurred in, in about a 12 hour period of time or something like that, that tree that was full of life, full of leaves and full of strength and growing, that tree now is withered. The leaves are falling off and they're all curling up and it's dead from the roots up because Jesus had said to it simply, let no more fruit come from you at all. Something to that effect. And the tree obeyed him instantly and died. Well, the Lord Jesus then came to demonstrate God's love and compassion with these miracles of healing and resurrection and to speak the word of God. And then he came to call sinners to repentance. If you'll read the early records of Jesus' ministry, you'll find him in Galilee of the Gentiles. And it's there that he's preaching in behind uh, the, the apostle uh, and, and uh, John the Baptist. He's preaching behind John the Baptist. And he's preaching exactly the same message. Repent for the kingdom of heaven's at hand. And he also promises forgiveness, uh, though he baptizes no one. And then uh, finally, he's... he's come to remind the world of end times. Jesus had more to say about the end of this world than anybody else in Scripture. He really did give a picture of a coming judgment and a final answering of all of us so far as our lives are concerned at the return of the Savior. And the fact is that when we start talking about the person of Jesus and we start talking about the work of Jesus, we have what we can read in the Scriptures but then when we try to flesh that out and we try to understand it in terms of what little uh, our human understanding can grasp, the fact is that we exhaust language and we deplete the ability of human language in our attempts to describe all of the accomplished work of Jesus. I think John was there. Uh, when you read his gospel, 
which is a marvelous, marvelous piece of literature. When you read the Gospel of John, and you come to the very last verse of the very last chapter, the closing statement of John uh, in what we call the Gospel of John. And John says this, uh, if I may paraphrase it. He says, there are so many things that Jesus did. And they're not recorded in my book that I've written to you. And I suppose if they were to be recorded, there's not enough books to hold everything that he did. I don't know all that Jesus did. We, from John's record, what we have here is a limited account. It's by no means exhaustive. We don't know how many people he raised from the dead. We don't know how many lepers he cured. Uh, we don't know how many uh, uh, others with fevers and sickness and blame, blindness and lameness and the rest of it. We don't know about all the miracles that Jesus did. It may be that part of our joy in heaven is going to be just to review and see our Savior in the larger view of the totality of his human experience. We do know this, that, uh, that he, he came to represent his Father's point of view and to reveal his Father. And that was his work, and that was to bring glory to the Father. Now, having said that, uh, I want us to think lastly about this son that the father speaks about. This is my beloved son. And I want to talk to you about the success of his son. I think sometimes we churchmen think we have the measure that we can lay out and measure how successful the Lord Jesus is or has been or will be. And may I say this with some carefulness. When you talk about the success of Jesus, you really have to stop and say to yourself, whose yardstick am I going to use to measure whether he was successful or not? Remind yourself of this. The Lord Jesus never built a single big city. He never ruled a great, vast piece of land. He never raised or commanded a great military army. He did not amass a huge fortune. He did not seek, and nor did he gain great favorable celebrity and fame. And you know why he didn't do any of those things? Because that was not his purpose. The Father didn't send him to do any of that. Because all of that a mere man can do. But he's not a mere man. Ordinary folks can do those things. And ordinary folks can mess up those things just as well as they can fix them. But that was not what Jesus came to do. His solitary purpose in coming to planet earth was to perfectly reveal the nature of God his Father, to reveal his Father's will and purpose for all of creation, and in the process of doing that, to call his people to himself that he may give to them what he called eternal life to as many as, as he was commanded to give that gift to. This perfect and complete and infallible salvation that he gave to us. Now if you're a Christian, you're a saved person, understand you've received a gift that Jesus came from heaven to earth to give to you. To give to you. You say, well, you, Brother Kermit, if you just knew what a great person I am, you'd know why he gave it to me. I deserved it. Well, you'd be, excuse me, but you'd be lying to yourself and you'd be making the most foolish assumption that a man can make or a woman can make. No, he came to seek and to save that which was lost. And he caused us to be found. We were dead in trespasses and sins. He made us alive. We were the, of our father, the devil. He's made us the children of God. You see, he's totally transformed, turned the whole basket upside down and set it aright. In behalf of those he came to seek and to save. 
And so the last thing we're going to say about this, he also came to secure. If he sought them and he saved them, he also secured them. You, do you hear what I'm saying? When the father says, this is my beloved son at the beginning of his ministry, public life. I've looked back over his private life. It's absolutely perfectly acceptable and approvable by me, says the father. Now he's at the end of his life. He's, at the, he's, he's just hours away from the crucifixion. What shall I say? Shall I say, let this cup pass from me? But for this reason, I came to this time. And then he says, Father, glorify your name, even as you glorify me. And the Father said, this again, the Father speaking out loud says, I have glorified you, and I will glorify you. And the fact that right at 2,000 years since Jesus went to the cross and then on the third day rose again, all over planet Earth, there are people meeting in little meetings like this one. And you know why they're doing that? Because his glory has not diminished. He has totally succeeded in what he set out to do. And he's still about the business of seeking and saving and securing his people. If he warned us about things yet to come, he also warned us about a judgment that's yet to come. And he saved us from the judgment and penalty of our sinfulness by his own suffering and his sacrifice on the cross. And uh, I've, I've mentioned this to this congregation a number of times. It's, it's a thing that constantly grabs at my heart. When in the Lord Jesus, in, in his final response on the cross, cried out, it is finished. And what was he saying? He was saying, Father, all that you gave me to do, I've done. All that you've told me to say, I've said. Every life you've wanted me to touch, I've touched. It is done. Amen. Finished. Completed. Accomplished is his word. And then he gave up his spirit. And when all of that's done, and it's all said and done, from his birth to his introduction into the world of ministry and then to his finished work after those three years plus of public work in, among the people of the Middle East. And he comes to the cross and he gives up his life. And he did say this, that nobody's taking my life from me. I'm giving my life. He's, he is the self-willed sacrifice. He's giving himself a ransom for many. And he gave his life up. And from then, right on through until it was over, and on the third day, he rises again from the dead to live forevermore. Amen. Alive again. And the father says, just before his death, he's, he's struggling with that. He's, he's agonizing with his reminiscent of John's account of, of uh, the garden. And the father says, listen to it. This is my beloved son. And every one of those words is significant. In whom I'm well pleased. And in this account he says, hear him. Or the literal translation I think is, as for you, you must hear him. It's an imperative. It's a command. This is my beloved son. Hear him. He's commanding everyone that hears this word to listen to what Jesus has to say. To hear him in terms of his placing claims upon the life. Receive his word. Hear his word. His finished work on the cross. And all that he's accomplished on your behalf. And this living and listening is not just what we do at a moment when we come to know Him as our Savior and Lord, but the living and the listening and the hearing of the Son of God is an imperative for us every single day that we live from the time He redeems us and saves us. And we know that we're now belonging to Him. 
we enter upon a life that is nothing less than being constantly attuned to hearing him and saying to him on a daily basis, Lord, this is a day that you've given me. What will you have me to do today? To whom am I to speak today? In whose presence am I to live and walk and breathe today? And how am I to extend your message and present you to the world that you've left me to live in? Do you understand we're not to live to ourselves, but we're to live to him? We're not to live about what makes us happy and glad, but we're to live in terms of what makes him glad and happy about the lives we live. And how do we do that? How do we do that? Well, very, very simply, we really have to live a life of listening. I have a, I have a wonderful son. I'm going to make a statement about him. But I think he inherited from his mother. I'll blame it there, you know, because I don't want to take the blame for it. Uh, he, he inherited from his mother the tendency to talk. And every time he calls me on the phone, hey, Dad, what you're doing? He doesn't want, want to know what I'm doing. He wants to tell me about what he's doing. <laughs> where are you going, Dad? He doesn't want to know where I'm going. He wants to tell me about where he's going. Oh, well, let me tell you about something just happened to me. And I won't get started before he said, oh, that reminds me, Dad, I did almost the same thing, and here he goes. And, and I have several members of my family that were vaccinated with what we used to call a Victrola needle. You have to be an old person to know what that is. But I mean, they just can really talk. And they talk, and they talk, and they talk. In fact, you can go to a Christmas party with my family. Get over in the corner and never say a word, and it'll go on for three hours, and there'll never be a moment of silence. <laughs> Somebody is going to be jawing the whole time. I'm just saying that to say that we're far better talkers and noisemakers than we are listeners. The last word that our father said about his son out loud was, This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. I wonder as you start your new year, would you do this? It's a suggestion. Just start saying, Lord Jesus, make me a better listener than I've been up till now. And let me, like the prophet of old, hear in the middle of all the noise that's going on. Help me to hear your still, small voice and acknowledge that you are indeed speaking to me. You're directing my life. And, of course, what that means is that sometimes as you <laughs> are in your walk, he'll say, stop. And you'll say, well, I will in a little bit. And he says, stop now. Well, I, I got to get over here first, and when I get over here, I'll think about stopping. And that isn't what he said, because we're not very good listeners. Sometimes he says, go. And you say, well, I, I will. And he says, go now. And you say, well, you don't understand. I haven't had my bologna sandwich yet. I need to get that taken care of. And then, then I'll think about going. You, you hear me? Aren't we that way? I, I know you all aren't trying holy and you're sanctified fully but I'm not but I find those tendencies here that that's that's the way it works a lot of times that we we listen we hear a little bit and then we turn the volume down Scotty we don't want to listen anymore because we we got our mind made up about what we want to do and whose we are and we need to hear once more this is my beloved son hear him. I hope you'll do that. We're going to sing a song, Miss Ann. Give me that number. Oh yes, it's on page 89. And we're going to stand as we sing together. And uh, if there's a matter on your heart or in your life that I can help you with or anyone in our, st uh, our church family can help you with, if you want to let that be known to me, I'll, I'll share that with the church family. And you're invited to do so. 
Oh, oh, come all you faithful. And I particularly like the chorus, so sing out strongly, won't you please? Page 89. Oh, here we go. Oh, come all ye faithful, joyful and triumphant. Oh, come ye, come ye to Bethlehem. Come and behold him, born the King of angels. Oh, come, let us adore him. <clears throat> oh, come, let us adore him, Christ the Lord. Just a moment. When we sing this next two verses, would you do this, please? When we get to the chorus, uh, if you look at the way it's written, the first phrase, O come let us adore him, is written just for the melody singers. These would be the sopranos, okay, the melody singers. The next phrase uh, then moves from one part singing really to three parts singing. And when you get to the last one, you've got four parts singing. If you look at the musical line. And so we'll just do it this way. Sing the first, O come let us adore him. Sing it quietly to your own heart. This is something I must do is come and adore him. And then there might be somebody next to you. You just say, let's adore him. And then the third time you say, let's adore him. It gets bigger every time, okay? Let's sing it that way. Here we go, Miss Ann. All right, here we go. Sing choirs of angels. Sing in exultation, O oh, sing all ye bright hosts of heaven above. Glory to God, all glory in the highest. O oh, come, let us adore Him. Oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him, Christ the Lord. Yea, Lord, we greet thee, born this happy morning, Jesus to thee be all glory given. Word of the Father, now in flesh appearing. Oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore Him, Christ the Lord. Well, thank you and praise the Lord. It's been good to be with you. Have a, have a wonderful, safe evening. Brother Sam, would you lead us as we pray and we'll be dismissed. Would you do that, please? Thank you. Let's bow together.